Good morning, good afternoon to everybody who's joined us today for the dissemination webinar on the impact on social inclusion of high volume transport corridors and potential solutions to identifying and preventing human trafficking. I'm going to give it another minute or so to let any more uh, participants join us and then we will continue. So thank you for your patience. So, a very warm welcome to participants from government, from civil society, private sectors in Tanzania, Uganda, Kenya, other countries in the region, Europe and further afield. Just a few housekeeping issues to begin with. This session is being recorded and everyone apart from the presenters will be placed on mute for the duration of this webinar. If you'd like to introduce yourselves using the chat function, please do so. There'll be a chat symbol on your screen. There'll be a question and answer session at the end of the presentation. So do please send through questions or comments using the chat function and we'll try to address these. Any questions not answered during the webinar will be answered via the email at a later date. The recordings and slides will be distributed to everyone who is registered for this webinar. Let me now introduce the panel. My name is Neil Retty and I'm the transport specialist for this project from Transaid. I'd like to introduce Cathy Green, team leader for the research from DT Global Emerging Markets. Eva Mwai, who leads on stakeholder engagement for the project from North Star Alliance. Jacob Odiambo, um, monitoring and evaluation specialist also from North Star Alliance and Sam Clark, Transport Technical Lead from Transaid. And last but not least, behind the scenes, managing the technology, we have Ed O'Connor and Shadi Ambrosini from Transaid. So this is the final dissemination of a research project that explored the relationship between high volume transport corridors and human trafficking. The research is funded by UK Aid through the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office and delivered under the High Volume Transport Applied Research Program managed by DT Global. Our research was implemented by DT Global Emerging Markets, Transaid, North Star Alliance, and Scriptoria. Next slide, please. The background to this research programme is that transport corridors play a critical role in Africa's economy. Increasingly efficient trade routes, border crossings and a rise in heavy goods traffic thought to be con contributing to the rise in human trafficking or trafficking in persons, TIP. ILO 2021 global estimates of forced labour is 24 million, 24% from Africa. Note the ILO estimate and is on forced labour does not include state-sponsored forced labour in countries such as North Korea. So the 24 million applies purely to the private economy. Um, there's an estimated 6.3 million people in forced sexual exploitation, 78% of whom are female, 27% are children. An important Jesse challenge, Jesse being the gender empowerment and social inclusion um, challenge for transport and infrastructure sectors, women and girls are more likely to be trafficked and trafficking tends to affect vulnerable individuals. Next slide, please. Our research objectives were to investigate the role played by 
high volume transport corridors in traffic in persons in Tanzania and Uganda. To explore some of the factors, transport related and regulatory contribution to trafficking in persons along the high volume transport corridors. To assess the level of awareness of trafficking in persons and its impacts among the transport providers, users of high volume transport corridors and communities through which these routes pass. And to identify pilot innovations that can help identify and counter trafficking in persons along the high volume transport corridors. Study ultimately about safe inclusion in the long distance strategic transport sector. Thank you. Next slide, please. This project was conducted over uh, 29 months, which began in August 2020 and ends um, in 2022, December next month. It wants to be implemented in five phases, as you can see on the screen just now. However, unfortunately, phase four of the pilot interventions was cancelled due to budget cuts by the funder. Next slide, please. So the scale of traffic in person is huge. Whilst reporting from the authorities in country are relatively low, as you can see by reports from the Ugandan police and the government of Tanzania, the Walk Free Foundation, citing Global Safety and Global Slavery Index, reported in 2019. 304,000 victims in Uganda, 336,000 victims in Tanzania. Huge, horrific numbers. Next slide, please. So human trafficking has many purposes. It can be for domestic servitude, agricultural labor, mining and construction, forced marriage, organ removal, trafficking for war, street begging, sex trafficking, and child sex trafficking. Many of these pretty horrific. Anyway, now I would like to hand over to Jacob from North, North Star Alliance. Next slide, please. Thank you, Neil, uh, for giving us that uh, very good background of the project. Uh, maybe just to start by uh, taking us through the literature review work that we did uh, before we went to the field uh, to collect uh, more knowledge. Um, what we found was that uh, there is very few and scarce uh, uh, knowledge or information focusing on transportation phase of uh, human trafficking or actually the role of vehicle operators or the players on the transport corridors as facilitators of human trafficking. And then uh, discussions of uh, trafficking networks focus on employment agencies, crime syndicates, and general recruiters, uh, not really focusing on the vehicle operators or the people who uh, work on the transport corridor specifically. Uh, we also came across literature on, uh, and, and, and just looked at literature, especially during this time we were doing the research, then the issue of COVID came about, COVID-19, and uh, literature on effect of COVID-19 on human trafficking, increased incentives for victims and traffickers. There was a review of anti-TIP legislation. Uh, some laws mentioned transport and transport actors. For example, the Palamo Protocol and the East Africa Co uh, Community Counter Trafficking in Person Bill, which also brings about the state parties uh, uh, laws and legislation on human trafficking. Uh, we, we concluded or just looked at uh, generally that there is not, not yet a strong call uh, within, within the literature about the need to work with transport sector to address human trafficking. So uh, we actually look at other sectors and the transport sector has sort of been left behind. Next slide, please. Uh, this slide just shows us the research overview. Uh, this was a cross-sectional research study, which was had uh, both quantitative and uh, qualitative components. Uh, the sample for the quantitative component was 1,548 respondents. And the sample for the qualitative component, we had 55 
uh, key informants uh, that contributed knowledge uh, and information. Uh, just to give us an overview of who the key informant were, uh, we had the transport police, we had the border officials, who are actually government uh, employees also, uh, transport associations that work along the corridors, uh, driving training schools. This is where the most of the drivers or drivers are being trained uh, to be ready to drive on the roads. Then we also interviewed survivors and worked with uh, organizations that uh, rescue and uh, rehabilitate survivors. And finally, we also uh, talked with uh, civil society organizations and just gathered their information and knowledge on this. Um, the, in terms of quantitative data, the, the people that we targeted were truck drivers and the driver uh, cohort had different typologies mixed in it. We had drivers of uh, truck dri truckers or the, what is usually called long distance truck drivers. We had drivers of buses and coaches and also taxis that all are used in the transport corridors uh, where people uh, travel. Uh, but also we, we talk to conductors and turn boys. So these are assistants and people who also play a, a role in the transport sector across the road transport. Um, for the community cohort, we had um, people who work or live either at truck spots or across borders checkpoints where uh, the transport uh, happens. Next slide, please. Um, we did due diligence in, in ensuring that uh, the research had uh, ethical approvals. And this was uh, the dynamic of this research. The fact that it was being conducted in two countries meant that we had to seek ethical approval in both countries uh, so that the research was above board in terms of ethical review and approval. In Tanzania, we worked with the National Bureau of Statistics and we also uh, worked with Tanzania Commission for Science and Technology, Postec, who actually gave the approval. In Uganda, we worked with MILDE Uganda Research Ethics Committee, UREC, and also the Uganda National Council for Science and Technology, uh, where we also got uh, the approval and they go ahead uh, to conduct the research. Next slide, please. Uh, just to give us an overview of the locations in both countries, so we had four research sites in total, and three of these sites were actually border crossings, and one of them was a key transit location. So for Uganda, the two sites were actually, both of them were border uh, crossings. One is a Busia border in, uh, that uh, connects Uganda to Kenya, and it's actually uh, um, in the Northern Corridor. Then we also had Malaba border, which also connects Uganda to Kenya, and uh, it's also part of the Northern Corridor. Then in Tanzania, uh, we had two sites. One of them is Arusha, and Arusha is a key town, which is uh, a few kilometers to the Kenyan border uh, to Tanzania in, in a place called Namanga. And the corridor there is called the Great North Road. In uh, the, other, the last location in Tanzania was Tunduma, which is also a key border crossing from Tanzania crossing into Zambia. Uh, using the Dar es Salaam corridor. Next slide, please. Uh, thank you. So I'll, I'll just uh, uh, go to the characteristics of the sample. Next slide, please. So this is just an overview of the respondents that interacted uh, with the team and we who contributed to the knowledge. Uh, in terms of gender, in Tanzania, 46% of the respondents were male and 54 were female, uh, whereas in Uganda, 52% were male and 48% were female. Uh, just to give a snapshot uh, of uh, this slide, you will notice that Tanzania, uh, uh, the, the highest population uh, was uh, female, and in Uganda, the highest population in terms of gender was male. Uh, in terms of age, uh, for both countries, uh, 25 to 34 years, most of the respondents were aged 25 to 34 years. In Tanzania, we had 45% and in Uganda, we had 47% in that age category. And um, we see that uh, uh, the, the other age band is 35 to 49, which also has a higher representation, 
compared to age 18 to 24 and 50 and above. In terms of employment, uh, most of the respondents for Tanzania reported to be business persons or entrepreneurs or traders along the corridor. And in Uganda, the highest uh, population was actually both um, uh, business people or traders, but actually reported to other. They had different um, uh, characteristics, but mainly uh, touching on doing business or trading along the corridor. And then we also had 30% uh, of these to be female sex workers who also work along or move along the corridors. Next slide, please. Uh, this slide actually gives a general overview of the vehicle operator sample. And in this also, again, for the transport, uh, all in both countries, 99% of the respondents were male with only 1%. And I think that's general, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's generally, it's a sector dominated by uh, male. So these uh, findings actually just concur with that, that a very small percentage of uh, truck drivers and people who drive along the corridors uh, are male. Uh, again, you will notice that in terms of the categories, uh, we'll see 25 to 34 years and 35 to 49 years being the highest represented in terms of uh, uh, age category and participating in the start. The type of vehicle for um, the high, high, high volume transport, that's uh, what we call the long distance. Uh, in Tanzania, we had 45%. And in Uganda, we had 68%. So my, most of the respondents had this type of vehicle. And then uh, we had buses, 16% for Tanzania, car taxi, 6%. Um, and then we had a very small representation in uh, the other, which is ad actually other smaller vehicles, but actually still are uh, used to, uh, to travel either across the borders or along the corridors. Uh, in terms of role, most of the respondents were drivers at 80, 89% in both countries. And we had conductor 9% in Tanzania and 4%. And then other uh, turnboys in, uh, that to make 2% in Tanzania and 7%. Um, I just mentioned one uh, percentage in, the, in terms of distance. Um, uh, you will notice that in Uganda, 63% of the respondents uh, traveled long distance. While in Tanzania, it was almost balancing where 47% did short distance, while 41% uh, did long distance. So the short distance could be uh, across the borders or just facilitating transport along the transport corridor. Um, in terms of employment status, the self-employed in Tanzania were 25% and in Uganda were 15%. And then the bigger proportion, especially for Uganda, more than half, uh, were working for a company. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so thank you. I'll uh, request my colleague Kathy to continue from there. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Jacob. Um, so I'm going to present some of the headline findings of our research. Um, and just to say that we've produced a very detailed research report and we'll put the link to that um, into the chat function if you would like to follow up and uh, look at more of the detail um, of our findings. Um, next slide, please. So one of the first things we did was um, we spoke to the communities that uh, lived and worked along the high volume transport corridors and we um, asked them with, if they had heard of human trafficking and whether they had seen any cases and um, these would obviously be suspected cases. So what we found was that 65% of community respondents in Tanzania had heard of human trafficking but many more in Uganda so 96% of our community respondents in Uganda had heard of uh, human tra trafficking. When we look at the uh, number of cases uh, seen by community respondents 20% uh, um, of community members had seen cases in uh, Tanzania versus 62% uh, in Uganda. So we can see, you know, um, much more obvious human trafficking activity um, that was noticed by our community uh, respondents in, in Uganda. Next slide, please. We asked the same question of vehicle operators. Um, have you heard of human trafficking and have you seen um, any suspected cases? 
um, a high proportion of vehicle op uh, op operators had heard of human trafficking. So 78% in Tanzania and 84% in, in Uganda. Um, interestingly, almost two thirds of the vehicle operators had actually observed cases um, as well. So 64% in Tanzania and 65% in Uganda. So quite interesting findings there. Next slide, please. Um, when we take the vehicle operators and compare to the community, um, we found that vehicle operators in Tanzania were three times as likely to have seen cases compared to the community. So if, if we look at the column um, on the left hand side, 20% of community members had seen cases and 64% of vehicle operators had seen cases. Um, in Uganda, we didn't find those big differences between the community and the vehicle operators. So that in itself is um, quite interesting. Next slide, please. Um, we um, talked to community uh, members about um, whether there, well, we, we looked into whether there were any age differences and gender differences um, in knowledge of human trafficking. And what we found was that in Uganda, women knew less about human trafficking than men. So 61% of women in uh, Tanzania had heard of human trafficking versus 72% of men. We didn't find those differences by gender in Uganda. Um, we also found that the youngest community members had heard less than older age groups in, in Tanzania. So if we look at the 18 to 24 year age group on the left hand side of the graph, 49% of respondents in Tanzania had heard of human trafficking. And um, if we look at the older age groups, um, more um, of those age groups had heard, so 64%, 71%, um, and 90%. Next slide, please. We looked at um, age differences in knowledge of human trafficking amongst the vehicle operators. Um, and again, we found that the youngest vehicle operators in Tanzania knew less than the older respondents. Um, and we didn't find those age-related differences in Uganda. So if we look at the 18 to 24 year column um, and the green column there, 47% um, of uh, respondents, these are vehicle operators um, in Tanzania, had heard of human trafficking. If we look at the older age groups in Tanzania, 79%, 81% and 76%. So quite big differences based on age in, Uga in Tanzania, but not in Uganda. Next slide, please. We asked vehicle operators um, their views on which vehicles were most likely to be involved in human trafficking. And we had some interesting results here. In both countries, vehicle operators thought that heavy goods vehicles were more likely than other vehicles to be involved in, in human trafficking. Um, so if we look at the HGV column here, 53% of vehicle oper operators in Tanzania, 44% of vehicle operators in Uganda thought that heavy goods vehicles were going to were more likely to be involved in human trafficking. In Uganda, we found that taxis and private cars were mentioned by quite, quite a few vehicle operators. Um, so that's also quite an interesting finding. Next slide, please. Um, we asked vehicle operators um, where they were more likely to be approached by traffickers. Um, and it's quite interesting, um, only 4% of respondents in Tanzania said they didn't know, they didn't have any idea of where um, vehicle operators might be approached by a trafficker. Most of them had um, a view on it. But what we found was that there were many different locations mentioned. Um, border crossings seemed to be important in Arusha, so 38% of respondents mentioned border crossings there. In Tunduma, bus stations um, were more likely to be mentioned, and um, that was mentioned by 36% of respondents. In Uganda, um, urban areas were mentioned by 36% of respondents, and in Malabar, 31% of respondents mentioned truck, truck stops. So here, the takeaway is a variety of different locations mentioned, um, but there are some specifics uh, mentioned depending on the research site. Next slide, please. We asked vehicle operators um, about their perceptions of the risks involved with being involved in human trafficking. And um, it's pleasing to see that the majority recognise the high risks 
associated with being involved in, in human, human trafficking. But we also found um, that 21% of bus drivers in Tanzania and um, a third of minibus operators in Uganda said that there was little risk um, of being involved in human trafficking, and that's quite worrying. Um, we also found that 17% of minibus drivers in Uganda were completely unsure of the risk, so they just didn't know how to answer that question. And that also um, is quite a worrying finding. Next slide, please. We asked vehicle operators if they'd ever been approached by a suspected trafficker, um, and 9% of respondents in Tanzania said that they had, and 37% of respondents in Uganda said that they had been approached by a suspected trafficker. So these are quite significant results. So four times as many vehicle operators in Uganda said that they'd been approached by a trafficker compared to Tanzania. So quite striking differences between the two research countries there. Next slide, please. Um, we broke down the results by the type of vehicle um, associated with the respondent. Um, so, and asked the same, well, the same question was, have you ever been approached by um, a trafficker? So in Tanzania, 35% of bus and coach drivers said that they've been approached, um, and 11% of heavy goods vehicle operators um, said that they had been approached by a suspected trafficker. In Uganda, 44% of car taxi drivers and 35% of HGV drivers. So really your experiences of being approached by a trafficker, your interactions with um, traffickers depended on the type of vehicle that you drove. Next slide, please. We asked the same question um, of community members. Have you ever been approached by a suspected trafficker? Um, and if we look at the two columns on the left-hand side, 9% um, of community members in Tanzania and 27% in Uganda said that they've been approached by a suspected trafficker. So quite striking results there. Um, but what we can see again are the differences between Tanzania and, and Uganda. So three times as many respondents in Uganda said that they had been approached by a trafficker compared to Tanzania. We also um, found that women um, in both countries were three times more likely to be approached by a suspected trafficker than males. So um, that's also quite a striking finding showing that there are, you know, there's a gender um, issue here as well. But overall, I think these findings do confirm the vulnerability of border populations um, to human trafficking. Next slide, please. We asked um, vehicle operators how frequently their vehicles were checked on the border by border control officials. Um, so 81% of heavy goods vehicle operators and 70% of coach operators said that their vehicles were always checked. Without a doubt, they were always checked by border officials. But we also found that other types of vehicles, so for example, taxis and minibuses were far less likely to be routinely checked at the border. Now, in Tanzania, um, another finding was that quite a few of our respondents um, uh, fed back that they just didn't know or they didn't specify um, a, a, an answer to this question. So that in itself um, is quite an interesting finding. Next slide, please. For Uganda, um, the same question, how frequently are your vehicles checked at the border? So 66% of heavy goods vehicle operators said they were always checked by border officials um, versus only 38% of motorcycle taxis. So we can see some differences depending on the type of vehicle. Now, interestingly, 7% of motorcycle and tricycle taxis and 8% of car taxis said they were absolutely never checked. So in essence, these vehicles can move over borders um, without any uh, checking of, the, of their vehicle and who they're carrying. Next slide, please. We asked vehicle operators their views on the role of border officials um, in, in human trafficking. So some quite interesting results here. 68% of vehicle operators in Uganda thought that border officers took bribes from traffickers. So quite a shocking result, in fact, 
um, 38% of vehicle operators in Tanzania thought the same. Um, only 9% of vehicle operators in Uganda and 19% in Tanzania thought that border officials absolutely weren't involved in human trafficking. So what we can see here is not a very high level of confidence in board officials um, role um, in combating human trafficking and then less confidence amongst um, the respondents in, in Uganda. Next slide please. We asked uh, vehicle operators their views on the role of traffic police um, in human trafficking. So again, some quite sort of shocking results. 61% um, um, of respondents in Uganda thought that the traffic police took bribes to facilitate human trafficking. 40% um, thought the same in Tanzania. Um, those that thought that traffic police absolutely weren't involved in human trafficking, 11% in uh, Uganda. 27% in Tanzania. So again, not a very high level of confidence in the role of traffic police in relation to their anti-trafficking role, and then less confidence um, in the traffic police in Uganda as compared to Tanzania. Next slide, please. We asked vehicle operators um, uh, whether they had received any training or information on human trafficking. Um, and generally, um, the percentage that had uh, was quite low. So in Tanzania, 7% had received some form of training or information in human trafficking. In Uganda, it was 10%. We've also, on the slide, on this graph, included the results for the individual research sites so that we can pick out any differences. Um, in Malibu, 15% of respondents, so these are vehicle operators, said they had received some form of training or information in human trafficking. So there's some possible evidence there of some anti-human uh, trafficking awareness raising work um, in that location. Next slide, please. We asked vehicle operators whether they had um, changed their attitude or behaviours um, in response to the training or information that they'd received on human trafficking. Um, and we were very pleased to see that a high proportion of respondents had, so 85% in Tanzania and 87% in uh, Uganda. So basically the majority um, said that these interventions had made a difference. But if we look at um, the second column, a set of columns, 10% of those who had received these inputs in Uganda said that it hadn't changed them at all, so it hadn't changed their attitudes or behaviour, and that's um, quite a concern. There is a caveat um, with these results in that um, quite a small number of vehicle operators had received any information or training, so we can't read too much into this result, but even so, um, it, it, it remains interesting. Next slide, please. We asked vehicle operators what their employers um, could do to help tackle human trafficking. 73% um, in Uganda and 63% in Tanzania and said that some form of training or information uh, would be very useful for them and that would be um, a good input by employers. 23% um, of respondents in Uganda mentioned better supervision and 21% of respondents in Tanzania mentioned better pay. But really inputs uh, in the training and information uh, area uh, were of most interest. Next slide please. We asked the vehicle operators if there was a training in human trafficking, what would be your priority training topic, topics? In Tanzania, um, the priorities were understanding more about the law, the human trafficking law, um, and secondarily, how to identify victims. In Uganda, the priority topics were how to identify victims and then just practical things that drivers can do, the steps they can do if they see a suspected case. Um, what action can they take? Next slide, please. So we, um, as part of the qualitative research, we spoke to driver training schools and also transport associations in the two research countries. In Uganda, we also spoke to a um, transport union. Generally, a little time uh, is spent by the associations or training schools 
um, on human trafficking. Um, in Tanzania, the feedback was this isn't required or motivated by government. In Uganda, we heard that because human trafficking is not included as a module um, in the East African community standardized curriculum or regulations, it wasn't included as a module in the national driver training curriculum. Um, in Tanzania, um, the sense was that uh, the role played by the transport sector in human trafficking isn't being widely discussed at the moment. Whereas in Uganda, um, the union that we spoke to was already actively engaged in some form of sensitization activities on human trafficking, which was very positive indeed. Um, both the transport associations and the driver training schools um, mentioned that they would uh, be interested in incorporating um, some training or activities in, to help combat human trafficking in their day-to-day -day activities. Um, but they would need resources and other forms of assistance to help them um, take that forward. Next slide, please. So I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Sam Clark now, who's going to look at the implications of the research for policy and practice. Thanks, Sam. Thank you, Cathy. Um, so, to everyone, um, this section effectively constitutes a, a summary of the, uh, of the recommendations to come out of the findings from this research. And as Cathy, I think, mentioned earlier, um, the, once the report is available, I think it's going to be published online, there will be a, a, a more extensive and more detailed set of recommendations. There, but let's start with this summary for now. Um, indicates a limited understanding of, of the role that transport and transport corridors actually play in facilitating uh, T TIP. Um, that being the case, it is more often than not unrecognised as a negative externality when developing these corridors and. You'll see, you'll have to see when lots of money is being pumped into the corridors, um, a lack of any mention to do with trafficking versus in the TORs um, that, that accompany those projects, which, um, which we'd like to see changed. Um, this low level of awareness extends to, to, to the community level, where it can increase vulnerability to being trafficked, um, for everybody, but, but particularly uh, for the most vulnerable, um, and in this case, the research findings point to women and children. Um, likewise, vehicle operators, um, a notoriously difficult group of people to communicate with, many of them being away on jobs for, uh, for weeks, uh, in some cases, month, in some cases, month and months at a time. Um, these guys lack information. Um, they lack access to training on this subject, um, for which this study has actually established that there is actually a, a very high level of support for bringing this type of training in. Next slide, please. Border officials and traffic police, we've heard mention of those in the findings that Kathy's just presented. Um, the overwhelming feeling is that respondents to the questions, the interviews that we carried out, people want to see a more effective role for border officials and traffic police. Not a more effective role, but they want, we want border officials, we want traffic police to be seen to be playing a more visible and a more proactive role in combating human trafficking. Um, this means a more consistent approach when it comes to carrying out the required checks for all, and I emphasize all modes of transport, uh, and getting rid of this perception that there are so-called safe modes of transport, which, which might or might not be, but possibly won't be checked um, as they cross the borders. Um, this should, this should obviously apply equally to what we call informal and formal modes of transport. 
We recommend that given the, the transnational nature of human trafficking, that, that the leadership uh, on this matter should effectively emanate from a regional governance body, and in, in this case, with a focus on Uganda and Tanzania, um, that means the EAC Secretariat. Um, we feel that they should be playing a role in terms of standardising training materials throughout the region, uh, and then this can be supported at a national level through through the government, and also, as Kathy's just spoken about, the transport associations, which have expressed uh, a huge amount of energy in terms of willingness to support initiatives such as this. Uh, next slide, please. Just before I uh, cover this slide, I'm just going to encourage everybody to send in questions um, as we head towards the question section. Um, so this slide um, refers to a, a pilot intervention, which uh, as Neil referred to earlier, when he was speaking, we were unable to implement. Um, the reason for that being uh, a reduction in the, in the amount of funds available for this project. Um, however, what we did do as a project team, we took it upon ourselves to actually proceed with the development of a training manual, which specifically targets vehicle operators, um, the subjects of which um, are speak to the findings of uh, of, the, uh, of, the, of the findings that are already presented. Now, that training manual is available. I'm sure it will be more available widely um, in time, but at the moment, it is available on TransAce Knowledge Centre. And I will ask one of our members of our project team if they wouldn't mind entering in the web address for that in, into the chat. That would be great. Um, obviously, your input um, your feedback on the training manual would be would be very much welcomed. Next slide, please. We now enter the question and answer phase. Now that doesn't mean we're sort of phasing out. This this is not the last section of the webinar. Um, what we wanted to do was bring in the opportunity for you to ask questions and uh, questions um, at this point before we go into what we, what we consider to be the next steps as part of this project. So I'm going to just consult with my colleague and uh, I'll have a look to see whether there are any questions out there at the moment. Um, the first question um, is, you've developed a training manual. How are you going to take forward, how are you going to take it forward if the intervention is cancelled? Um, Neil, I, I think I'm going to pass that to you as you're the most sort of deeply embedded within the transport sector in East Africa. If you could answer that question, I'll be great. Yeah, well, one, I'd like to think we can get funding from somewhere to be able to do this. Um, but even if that doesn't come through, we can share the training manual that's been developed yeah. with lots of um, training providers in Tanzania um, and Uganda. And it'll be available on, on TransAid's uh, Knowledge Centre, as Sam has mentioned, so anyone can then access it, and we will try and keep disseminating it um, wider in the region as well. But yeah, we can try and start source additional funding to actually do the pilot. Brilliant. Thank you. And just to add to that, we are actually actively looking for additional funding to continue this research, uh, but also yeah, with a view to actually um, you know, making sure that as a result of this research, some, some action does actually happen. And, and this manual, we think, uh, forms part of uh, a key part of that, um, which we'd like to see turn into, into some action on the ground. Um, another question here is, what do we think is the reason why Transport is why, why there is no research on transport as as effectively human trafficking is a is a transitory sort of activity. Um, I am going to pass that question to Kathy, please. Okay, thanks very much, um, Sam. I think one of the um, key findings of the literature review is that the overwhelming majority of um, documents um, that we found on human trafficking talk about human trafficking as um, in terms of crime and punishment, 
Um, so it's all about um, you know, identifying more cases, seeing those through the courts, um, and making sure that um, the perpetrators basically you know, were fined or in, imprisoned or, or whatever. So I think that's the overwhelming emphasis within the literature at the moment. It, it really does drown out any emphasis on the transit stage of human trafficking and the role of the transport sector and the role of vehicle operators. Thanks, Sam. Thank you, Cathy. Um, this was something that, that struck me, but it's a question that's come in as well. Um, the, the results, I'm afraid this is to you as well, Cathy, so prepare yourself for this. Um, do these results tell us that the nature of trafficking in persons is different in Uganda than it is in Tanzania? And if so, what do we think is, in what ways are they different? Um, okay, so um, I would say again that um, we, we have found differences between the two countries and when we presented the headline findings, I think we were starting to see that. Um, so the scale and the embeddedness of human trafficking seem to be um, you know, bigger um, in, in, in Uganda versus Tanzania. But you know, there's a possibility, um, I guess, that you know, if it's more evident in in Uganda, that people are talking about it a bit more, and perhaps there's a reticence in in Tanzania to to reveal what you know. So that that's something that we need to um, look at as well. Um, I think if um, you know our audience are interested in the detailed findings, we do drill down into differences um, by research site. Um, so we've got four research sites, so do please read the, um, the reports um, that we're uh, sharing the links to. Thank you, Cathy. Uh, I must apologise to the audience for the background noise. It's uh, just started every rainfall here in Tanzania. Um, question to you, Neil. Uh, we, we were referring to the EAC curriculum and, and the fact that it currently lacks a module around human trafficking. What do you see as the potential? You know, what is the potential reach if if that was changed? Um, you know, if we added a, a module around human trafficking, um, what are the potential implications of that? Um, well, it could be huge. The, the EAC standardised curriculum is a standardised curriculum, as per the name, for the East African community, which has got recently expanded to now be is it seven countries what's that um tanzania kenya uganda rwanda burundi south sudan and the democratic republic of congo um, so so once these countries fully uptake um, the eac curriculum if we've managed to embed um trafficking in persons module within that and um, the reach could be huge um the, the population across these seven countries is huge the growing demand for quality drivers is huge as well. So getting drivers trained to high standard that includes um, a section on this um, would be a fantastic opportunity. Um, so yes, yeah, so the rollout of the EAC curriculum for use in all countries is is really critical for this. And just um, just as an add-on to that from me, Neil, um, what do we see as do we see the energy and the willingness within training providers to actually really take that on and, and, and deliver that training? Yeah, training training providers do seem very keen to get trained in higher standards of, of driver training. So we see that as, as very positive for rolling it out. Challenges is getting the funding to be able to train the trainers in each of these countries. Um, but if funding were available. Um, I'm sh absolutely convinced that the driver trainers would be very, very keen to undergo this training, get certified to deliver this training, and then roll it out to all the drivers they're training in trucks and buses, etc. Thank you, Neil. Um, question for you, Jacob. Um, what sort of safeguarding measures were, were put in place? Uh, so I'm, I'm positioning this to you, actually, because you were most involved in, in the actual field work. What sort of safeguarding measures were put in place um, during the during the research sort of section of the project? 
to protect the, the researchers, but also the, the people you're talking to. Thank you. Um, we had uh, several uh, safeguards uh, or safeguarding measures. One was that uh, the data collectors or the data uh, research assistants were well trained uh, on ethical and research standards, including uh, the value of confidentiality, the value of privacy, and just respecting uh, uh, the respondents and making sure that they, there is no harm caused in the line of uh, collecting the data. That was one. Two, we also worked with the community stakeholders so that uh, the, the, the project was not a strange or uh, 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 it was not perceived as something that was had not been given authority. So at every entry point, we worked with the commissioners, the district commissioners, the police commandant, and we had a direct line uh, provided for reporting any cases of, um, of, of, of that required safeguard, um, including the respondents adding when they were consenting, adding a direct number and an email or where they could report any forms of uh, breach or any um, any, anything they felt that uh, uh, infringed on their rights in any way. So we took into account uh, several safeguard measures, uh, including uh, the data the data collectors also were trained on how to safeguard themselves against any form of abuse or uh, risk uh, from during their work, because some of them actually were collecting the data at the truck spots at night. Uh, they, were, they had to work in teams and in pairs and not alone. So some of those were safeguarding measures that we took to just make sure that all stakeholders in the project were uh, well safeguarded and were not exposed to any risk. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jacob. Um, there is a question here on the training manual. Uh, the question is, will the training manual be used in both countries? Does it cover the context depending on the laws of that country on trafficking? Um, Kathy, you're probably closest to, to the training manual having sort of led on that activity. Are you, are you okay to answer that? Yeah, sure. Um... At the moment, the training manual is tailored more to the Ugandan context. Um, that was where we were planning to um, implement um, a training, a pilot training intervention. Um, but the training manual can easily be adapted um, to, to any country. So the major differences are, you know, when you take trainees through the background and the, the context of human trafficking, you want some country specific data in there. You want some country specific information on the CSOs that deal with um, or provide um, safe haven for victims and survivors of human trafficking. So you, you can tailor um, that. But, you know, ultimately, if the training is to be uh, implemented, it needs to be done um, with the approval of, you know, the, the government and other authorities in the, in the country concerned. So there must be a step where you know the, the training manual is tailored um, before it's finally um, used um, to reflect you know interests and concerns and issues brought forward by those key stakeholders. Thanks, Sam. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, question. I'll take this question. Um, how responsive are other organisations working in this field been? to this project and the simple answer to that question is um, that the civil society organizations the NGOs um, have been incredibly proactive and uh, participative and, and willing to contribute to this project and, and we thank them for that um, it's it's a surprisingly large community of small organizations working in this field but um, they are doing an incredible amount of, uh, of work and, and really impactful work as well. Um, so we'd actually like to take this opportunity on this webinar to thank every single one of them. Um, we, as part of this project, we had a consultative group um, to sort of contribute feedback, input uh, at the, the key phases of the project. And, and as I said, the, the NGO, the civil society organizations were incredibly active, as were uh, representatives from government, 
and Facebook, police, and, and others as well, and in fact, uh, some private sector as well. Um, so overwhelmingly positive. Um, I, I think there is, is certainly an energy for positive change on this front um, going forward. Uh, next question is, uh, do we see any potential for a similar sort of initiative or possibly a need for a similar sort of initiative in West Africa? Um, and oh, I'm not sure where to give this to. I'm going to give it to Jacob. What do you know about West Africa and, and the appetite over there for, for something similar? Is there, is there an issue in West Africa equally? Uh, to be honest, currently I'm not aware of uh, any of that uh, in West Africa, but it's an interesting something to look up. I think we'll take it up and just see uh, what is happening in West Africa and what are the possibilities in terms of a uh, similar project or what has already been done. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, I, I mean, just to write on to that, um, there is undoubtedly a need um, sort of on a, on a national and a regional um, level in West Africa. Um, but possibly, um, possibly able to say that a lack of sort of support from donors for projects such as these. So hopefully projects like this and dissemination of events like this can, can inform donors and, and sort of reposition their, their stance on, on issues such as this going forward. Um, unless there are any final questions, um, I'm going to head into the last few slides and just tell you a little bit about um, the next steps that are involved in this project. So if, Ed, if we could uh, skip forward one, two slides, I think it is. Brilliant. Thank you. So um, I think we, we recognise the fact that this research has its limits there are gaps in this research as well and that more research is needed so uh, maybe we could go through to the next slide and just have a look at what we consider to be some of the areas that, that could be uh, could be addressed um so transport's role in facilitating human trafficking um bus and coach uh, bus, bus and coach drivers were as you saw in, in the results, notably underrepresented in the research, but undoubtedly have a lot to offer in terms of proving our understanding of the situation. Um, and obviously in many cases, uh, according to some reports, are seen to be sort of key actors in, in facilitating uh, the trafficking in persons. Um, likewise, a, a cross-sectional compa uh, comparison between the different ties within the transport sector would be really interesting. Um, talking about the different tiers within the transport sector, you've got the, the small enterprises, the medium enterprises, which in effect sort of make up a completely different tier to the sector than, than do the larger international companies. And it would be interesting to, 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 to dig a little deeper into to what how perceptions differ between the two sort of levels within the sector and, and what the willingness and proactivity levels are for, for actually taking the action. And finally, um, how best to reach informal transporters are, are always a challenge. Um, as we know, the informal transport sector is, is far more disjointed um, and requires sort of different ways of communicating with but uh, an important one nonetheless, and uh, as Kathy pointed to, especially when uh, many of the, 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 the sort of modes of transport within the informal sector are, are not necessarily being subject to, to, to checks at the border crossings and so forth, obviously a really important one to engage with. If we could go through to the next slide, please. Next steps. Um, so we have submitted a journal article to the Journal of Transport and Health, which is already currently under review. 
Um, so as soon as that is published, hopefully you will know about it. Um, we will share that and please do feel free to get in touch anytime to ask about it. Um, we plan to do everything we can to disseminate the training manual, as we've already said, um, that we've developed and to identify our funding source, which, we will, which will allow us to, to at least run a trial implementation, uh, a pilot implementation to sort of generate evidence. Um, and finally, um, we're immersed in the final reporting of the project map, which is coming to an end um, very, very soon. And in fact, in the next week or two. Um, so uh, with that, I would like to say next slide, I think that should be the final slide. We will, of course, continue to disseminate the, uh, the findings of the report. But um, with that, I would like to say uh, a huge thank you to everyone that's attended today. Um, a massive, immense thank you to everybody that we have met along the way that's participated in this project, uh, civil society, government, private sector. Um, it's been a, a complete education from our perspective. We hope that we've contributed something to the discussion uh, in terms of the role that transport and transport corridors play in terms of facilitating human trafficking. And uh, from the rest of the project team, thank you very much and have a good day. Thank you.